Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll visit with actress Vicki Lawrence and hear why she's working to raise awareness of a chronic skin condition. And we'll speak with the author of a new novel set in the future of a drought-stricken Southwest. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Governor Doug Ducey today announced plans to increase K-12 education spending with money from state land trust sales. The governor outlined his plans at a press conference this afternoon. It is a request to the voters of Arizona, a very simple one. Let's put new money into our public schools without raising taxes. Here are the specifics. To raise the 2.5% distribution formula to 10% for a period of five years. That would mean at least $325 million a year in new dollars to our schools. Nearly $2 billion total over the five year period. Anything that will put more dollars into the classroom, I'm in support of. The devil will be in the details with this one. Uh, the estimate is that it will increase uh, funding about $300 per student per year for those first five years, uh, if the voters approve it. The funding proposal comes as the governor faces increasing criticism over his education policies and spending cuts. Emmy Award winning actress Vicki Lawrence is best known for playing a cantankerous but lovable matriarch in Mama's Family in The Carol Burnett Show. But Lawrence is now playing a real life role as a health advocate as she travels the country raising awareness for chronic idiopathic urticaria or CIU, a skin condition with no known cause or cure. Here now to share her own story about this little known condition is Vicki Lawrence. You just rolled that right off your tongue. Just like I knew what I was talking about. Exactly. I'm Welcome impressed. to Arizona Horizon. Thank you. Uh, it's great to have you. I can't wait to talk about the, the mama's family stuff and all that, but we got to talk about CIU. What, what are we talking about? Yeah, uh, it's a mouthful, isn't it? I, I was diagnosed about full of, a little over four years ago. Um, I woke up with my hands itching one morning. I said to my husband, buy a lottery ticket. We're coming into a lot of dough tonight. And it didn't go away. I woke up the next morning like Groundhog Day with my hands itching again. Next thing, thing I know, it's spreading all over my body. I, I remember walking the dogs home very quickly. I, well, you know, right to the allergist, something's wrong. I've done something wrong. I mean, the minute you get hives, you immediately think allergy. You've done something stupid. You changed your detergent. You, you know, you've ate a bad peanut. You, I don't know. Uh, and my allergist said, uh, yeah, most people break out in hives at some point in their lives. They go away. We don't ever think about it again. Not to worry. We'll get rid of it. Well, after six weeks of everything that you can possibly think of for an allergic reaction, uh, and they didn't go away, uh, he diagnosed me with CIU. And I, you know, when he's off his tongue, chronic yeah. idiopathic urticaria. And I'm like, seriously? <laughs> chronic meaning it's now lasted six weeks or more. Idiopathic, uh, I like to think of the root word as idiot. He cannot tell you why. He said you can scratch test all you want. I don't think you're going to find an answer. Uh, and urticaria is just the fancy doctor word for hives. Uh, so I, of course, went home and started Googling, and there was no information about CIU on the web. You know, there were a lot of people asking questions like, has this happened to anybody else? Do you know what this is? Right. I don't know what to do. Right. Uh, I've talked to people in this program that have been looking for answers for years. So uh, anyway, my allergist fortunately knew about CIU. We were able to find a treatment plan that worked for me. I am hive free. I've not seen a hive in three years. Thank you. But you know, again, it is treatable, but it's not curable. It's chronic for me and for a million and a half of us in this country. When you Googled, when you did research, when you talked to folks, what were you hearing? I mean, obviously, if something like this that has no known cause or, or cure has to be frustrating to deal with. Trying to find the answer is just the most frustrating part and you've got everybody in your ear. You know, my daughter's saying you need to get on a holistic diet or an elimination diet at the very mo uh, most, mom. And I'm like, but I haven't changed anything that I'm eating. Uh, I had, my intern had just put me on this whole new vitamin regimen. He said, there's obviously something you're allergic to. Obviously, stop. Uh, another good friend said, no, it's the tannins in the red wine, Vicki, and particularly oh. the American red wine. You must start drinking French only. And, uh, you know, everybody wants to help you, but nobody really has an answer for you. There is no answer. That's the hardest thing. I think if you're a CIU patient yes. is to accept the fact that it's nothing you've done. 
It Just For You is chronic, and that's the way it goes for, as I said, a million and a half of us. You said it came on four years ago. I'm going to play doctor here. Anything in the past? Any warning signs <laughs> in the past? No. I can't. And don't, when you think of hives, don't you think of your mother-in-law's nervous breakdown? Well, you, you, yes. You're marrying my son? She breaks out in <laughs> right. hives. Yeah, breaking know? out in hives. And I, I said to the doctor, I'm not stressed. Yes. I, I'm fine. What? He said, there's just no, no, this is the way it is. What about autoimmune? I don't, well, I don't they don't, the doctors do not have an answer for this. Uh, there are, however, as I said, treatment options. And when I was approached by this whole beautiful website was uh, supported by the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. And it's made possible by Genentech and Novartis, a lot of very smart people that know what they're talking about. They put together this beautiful website and said, would you put your face on it, share your story? And maybe we can get the word out there that it's that it's real. You haven't lost your mind. Uh, if you are itching and can't find an answer, perhaps you want to get on there. There are downloadable materials so you can track your hives, which I think is really important, and take pictures. Right. Because you know the way the medical profession is nowadays, you may not get to the right doctor for two or three weeks, uh, and you're not going to get a diagnosis of CIU for six weeks. So you want to be armed and dangerous when you get to that doctor. You know, here's what's going on. Sure and be sort of proactive about your own health and C know what questions to ask. Right, and, and CIUNU.com, mm -hmm. that's the website we're talking about, CIUNU.com. Yeah. Yes. L why did you decide to go public on this? I mean, some people would say, I got hives, I'm gonna go to the doctor, I can't get I rid of my hives, gonna, I'm gonna move on, but you know, you're, you're taking this public. What do I care? And if people laugh at that, then so be it, because you love to laugh at me, you know you do. <laughs> so I think it's, you know, I feel like everybody should have a place to go nowadays. And as I said, I didn't see anything that was remotely informative on the web when I looked. Now, if you Google CIU, you'll get to our website. Yes, that's true. And there is some good information there. All right, you mentioned that uh, people have been laughing at you for, for quite a while. I mean, it, when people see you in the airport, when they see you in the studio, they stuff just like, start laughing. They do. <laughs> you become mama, don't you? Particularly those, those TSA guys, they love to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, what, I mean, it's an odd question, but I mean, what's it like to know that you have had such an impact in, for so many years, for so many folks, just making them laugh, just giving them something to laugh about? It's an honor, um, you know? It's it's a, it's a great honor. Does it feel good? Yes, of course it does. Yeah. Of course, I do have people come up to me all the time and say, hi, where's Mama? Like, you know, she should be with me. <laughs> I'll get her. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> Quick you know, change. She's uh, more popular than I am, probably. When you first started the character, a Carol Burnett show, it was, I seem to remember just being a skit, just being a segment, and it mm -hmm. just exploded from there because almost everyone recognizes almost everyone in that family. When you first started it, did you think, we got something here? I don't know if you, uh, I, yes, we knew it was a great sketch. It was right. written by two writers, uh, both of whom hated their mothers. Uh, they wrote this beautiful homage to their dysfunctional upbringings. They uh, lovingly intended Carol to play Mama. She said, no, I want to be Eunice. They were very upset. She said, I want Vicky to be Mama. They were doubly upset. We got to rehearsal. She said, you guys, I think it needs to be Southern. Well, the writers were, so, well, you know, because she, she said, this is like Tennessee Williams on acid. So we have, to, <laughs> we have to do it Southern. The writers were so upset when they saw it, they walked out the first time. You're kidding me. No, they said, you've ruined our beautiful piece. So do you think you have something special? I mean, we knew it was funny. Yeah. We knew it was funny. I, um, I, I just love the part where you guys are, everyone's arguing. And then someone says, did you see what the dog just did? And the entire family then just becomes butter and they're getting along. Topaz. I think Topaz is <laughs> Topaz. Look at that cute little pie. Exactly. And everyone Boy, just changes. Look what he is doing. I mean, that is so, but <laughs> the reason people love it is because they recognize it. Sure. There's, there's a Absolutely. little of them in all those characters. Absolutely. But the writer said, you're, you're going to offend the entire southern half of the country. You have ruined our beautiful piece. And Carol said, this is the way I want to do it. So, and she was right. I learned a very important lesson from Carol right there. Yes. Trust your instincts. Trust your instincts. Were people insulted by it? No, on the contrary. Yeah, we I, all know that. You know, I always think of Mama kind of like Archie Bunker. We all know that guy. Exactly. So it's good for us to bond and laugh, to, laugh over that craziness, right? So what are you doing? And by the way, Mama's Family, you were telling me before the show, out on uh, DVD now, is that true? Mama's Family? Yeah. Yeah. Carol Burnett, all of that stuff out on DVD now. We've got a new one coming out in September. 
we just did all the little yeah. bonus features oh for it. Goodness. She was able to negotiate the uh, rights to the first five years when we were under a different production banner. I don't think any of those shows have ever been seen since wow. they were on the air. So, yeah, she, we've got a DVD coming out in September, uh, the Carol Burnett Show, The Lost Episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yes. Uh, and so what are you doing otherwise? How, how, how are you keeping busy? What are you doing? I'm on the road. I have a, a show that I put together called Vicki Lawrence and Mama, a two-woman show. And I brought the old lady out of the closet, and she does uh, half the show. And I, basically, I open for Mama. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's been quite a career. And again, I just think it's, I think it's wonderful to be able to look back and know that you've made so many folks happy. It just has to be a great feeling. It's and, a wonderful feeling. And to also tell people about CIUNU.com. Yes, all spelled out. C-I-U-A-N-D-Y-O-U. -U. And get there and download those materials and get some good information and watch my lovely video. And yeah. if you're itching, maybe this is the answer. Got an itch to scratch, that's where you go, huh? Maybe. Well, it's a pleasure having you on the program. It's nice to meet you, and Thanks, good luck you with all of your future endeavors. Thank you. New York Times bestselling author Paolo Bacigalupi has a new book out that is set mostly in Phoenix. The Water Knife tells the story about the near future when the American Southwest has been decimated by drought. When a game-changing water source is found in Phoenix, a spy and assassin, also known as a water knife, is sent to investigate. Here now to tell us more about his new novel is Paolo Bacigalupi. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You know, I'm getting through this book, and this is this is quite. I mean, this there's a lot going on in here, <laughs> a lot happening at all times. How did the idea? For, it's dystopian to a certain degree. American Southwest water. How'd you come up with all this? Uh, well, I've always been interested in the in southwestern water issues because I used to work for an environmental magazine called High Country News, and uh, so I followed a lot of science journalists. I was the online editor there. And the science journalists who were reporting on the issues in the Southwest were people like Matt Jenkins, who was reporting on how Lake Powell was getting lower and lower, and how Lake Mead was getting lower and lower, and how Las Vegas was digging deeper and deeper into Lake Mead to get water, things like that. Um, but also people like Michelle Nyhouse were reporting on climate change and how that was already affecting uh, the ecosystems in the, in the Western United States. And all that was happening, uh, you know, I think this, I first started thinking about this maybe 10 years ago, and yeah. stuff was already happening. And, since then, it's only gotten more and more interesting. So I, uh, yeah, it sort of uh, sucked me in, I guess. So describe the novel's landscape, because again, this is the future, and it, it feels like it's a little bit out in the future, but not that far out in the future, right. and things are very different than they are now. Right, yeah, it's sort of the 20 minutes into the future sort of feeling. Um, so this, in this future, uh, the, the, there have been mega droughts that have been sweeping through the country and, and changing the landscape quite a lot. So there are massive forest fires that are happening. There are huge dust storms that are occurring. Um, Las Vegas and Phoenix are sort of locked in a, in a, in a fight for water, uh, and each of them has terrible water rights on the Colorado River, and so they're each trying to sort of jockey for position. But uh, unfortunately for Phoenix, Las Vegas has planned better. Yeah, I was going to say Las Vegas seems to have the upper hand here. They certainly have a, a better uh, a militia out there. I guess they're kind of a militia. The water knife and Angel, the, the, the main character, the, the water knife, describe them, describe him. 
So water knives are basically sort of the 007s of water, and they're the, they're the people who go out for, on behalf of Las Vegas. Las Vegas has sort of hired this cadre of, of thugs, basically, who will go out and give people offers on their water rights that they can't refuse. They'll blow up other people's water treatment plants, um, and all, all the time while giving Las Vegas a certain plausible deniability. It's like, well, we don't know what happened over there. We don't know sad about that explosion there, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. And, but all the time uh, ensuring that Las Vegas has enough water to keep their economy going and keep their sort of arcologies running. Arcologies, so. and these are actually these these kind of weird indoor kind of self-sustaining systems that, that I guess the, the haves have and the have-nots just kind of look at. Right. They're they're almost entirely self-contained cities. You know, there's living environments, there's there's recreational environments. In in Las Vegas, they built these giant arcologies called the Cypress Arcologies, and they've got hanging gardens and waterfalls and and everything that comes into them just eternally gets recycled and kept. So all the water that comes in, they reuse and reuse. Um, all of their waste is reused and everything, and and uh, and that's their sort of solution to the to the increasingly devastating outside environments that they're dealing with. For something like this, what comes first? Do the characters come first, or does the scenario come first? Theme for me, oftentimes, so there is, is the a first theme thing. There. Yeah, and I think for me, like this one, originally the, the the thing that kicked me off to write this book was that I was down in Texas in 2011 during their droughts, and I was just astounded at how bad things were. Um, but one of the things that really struck me was that in the middle of this terrible drought down in Texas where farmers are putting their cattle down because the land can't support them and they're having rolling brownouts because they don't have enough water in their dams to generate hydroelectricity, um, at that same time as all that's happening, you realize that climate data basically indicates that's likely to be the new normal for Texas. Um, and that's really striking. Um, but then even more than that, uh, what was striking was that Rick Perry, who is once again a presidential candidate, um, was going around and encouraging people to pray for rain. Um, and that, for me, thematically was really interesting. The idea that we know we're going in a certain direction and then that our leadership is uh, uh, in denial about it, essentially. And what kind of future does that create? And then you start creating characters in that future and start to live right. in it and try to find out what it feels like. The characters ever surprise you? Yes, um, oftentimes, actually. Uh, the very beginning of a story, you're writing the characters and you're trying to build them out and trying to see who they are and what they, what they desire and, and where they're going to go. And you think you kind of have a handle on it. But uh, Maria actually turns out to be Interesting. Um, a far more, the, Maria is a, a Texas refugee. And she's um, fled from Texas and sort of washed up in Phoenix and can't get anywhere else because there's all these state border control laws. And, and she's very much a second class citizen in a place that's already falling apart. Um, because nobody wants Texans when everybody else is struggling anyway. Um, not like I'm biased or anything. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, uh, but she actually goes from a place of being extremely powerless to a very different spot. And I didn't see that coming in the story. That was very much a surprise to me. Where she ends up is a very, very different thing than I originally had planned for her. That's interesting because when theme kind of takes precedent over character and, and, and over landscape and these sorts of things, it can be dangerous, and I'm sure you're right. aware of this, to be being didactic, sure. being going through yeah. a, an outline as opposed to letting things play out and breathe. I let the characters do what they want. Thematically, what you're doing is the theme builds, gives you an idea of, of where you're at. So the theme says, uh, you know, I'm interested in reality-based characters and what happens, and I'm also interested in people who live in denial and what happens to them. We're going to build a couple of these people, and then we're just going to let them run around. <laughs> um, and so in that, they have a lot of life, and yeah, and then you can avoid the didacticism. Considering the nature of this, this book, and i got to tell you, reading this book, it's, it's, it can be tough at times. I mean, mm. this, is, this, is not a, this is not all flowers and, and butterflies. Right. So, did you get depressed writing it? I actually, weirdly, when I write these kinds of books, I actually get less depressed. Um, I, um, I write a lot because I'm trying to sort of purge anxieties that I already have. You know, I worry, like I look at my 11-year-old son and I say, well, what, what kind of future are we giving you? Are we doing everything we can to give you the good future? And I have a great deal of anxiety that says, maybe we're not. Um, and so when I write something like The Water Knife that sort of describes that future that I worry about. Um, in a way, it's a way of putting it on a shelf and setting it outside of myself. A little cathartic at times? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very much. Um, research, how much research and how much does this Just enough. <laughs> Just, uh, I'll bet, because so, there's a lot of stuff going on in here. But how much do you have to make? It's in the future. It's, it's, it's science fiction slash fantasy, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. 
but it has to be realistic to keep the, re the listener, the reader, I should say, uh, involved. So mm. how do you balance that? Well, so Margaret Atwood has a term for her writing, and she thinks of, she thinks of writing anticipations. Um, and I think of myself as writing extrapolations. You're looking at some present moment, and you're sort of just trying to spin it out. And you say, if this goes on, what might the world look like? And so you start from that grounded present moment. And then as you go out into the future, that grounding helps. But there's other things where you're going to choose a lot of details to make sure that that world feels real and lived in and absolute. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's, you know, the dusk mask that Lucy wears when she goes out into a giant uh, dust storm uh, is branded with REI logos. And, you know, you see things like Camelback and you see other major, you know, sort of corporate logos around. I've always sort of thought that the apocalypse will be accessorized. <laughs> and, and, but that also gives us a sense that there really is this real future and it really is connected right. to our present. There's a little Blade Runner-esque thing mm -hmm. happening there where you recognize something but then you don't recognize it. Right, but again, right. how do you do that without teaching people, without trying to teach, a, or do you want to teach a lesson here? Well, I think it's, I, I don't think you want to teach a lesson. I think you want to give people a chance to live inside of a different uh, skin. Um, I think that fiction's power is that it builds empathy. You get to live inside of somebody's skin that you don't know and have never cared about. And in this case, we're living inside of the future. The idea is that we go out into the future, whether that's 50 years or 100 years into the future, and we say, what does it feel like to live in the skin of a climate refugee? How does that feel? How scary is that? Um, and ideally, that empathy connection then comes back and it gives us another way to look at the world. Because a lot of times what I've noticed when we're talking about big issues like climate change is that people can get locked down in this, well, my facts say this, and my facts say that. And it's, it's sort of a pointless conversation. And so uh, you want to sort of move into that in a different way where it says, oh, this is what this feels like. Do we want to go this way? Maybe not. Well, you, you have certainly uh, set a scenario there in a the landscape and made it very realistic. And uh, it's a great read. Thank you so much for joining us. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you. And Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists' Roundtable. We'll discuss the governor's plan to increase education funding without a tax increase. And Arizona doctors file suit over the state's new abortion law. Those stories Friday on the Journalists' Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.